All right, everybody, welcome back to the open session of the September 2024 NHGRI Council meeting. Um, the rest of our business this afternoon is concept clearances, um, and the, we have four of them. So I ask that um, we all give our attention and discussion to them. These four are all renewal concepts, but I just want to remind everybody that whether a concept is for a new initiative or a renewal, all solicited funding opportunities must be presented to the council and approved by the council. So we'll be taking a vote on all four of these. Um, prior to the vote, we encourage questions and discussion. Um, in order to assess the, the relevance of these concepts for NHGRI. So we'll take these in the order in which they appear on the agenda. So we're beginning with the RFA entitled Impact of Genomic Variation on Function, or IGVF. And Stephanie Morris, a program director in the Division of Genome Sciences, will present the concept. Stephanie, over to you. Fantastic. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm presenting the renewal concept for the impact of genomic variation on function program, and I'm doing so on behalf of our NHGRI IGVF program team. That includes myself, Sarah Anstis, Afia Asari, Mike Payson, and Dan Gilcrest. So all of you uh, council members should have received a concept document in your ECB materials, and hopefully you've had a chance to review the document before coming in today. Uh, and hopefully you had a chance to stretch your legs. It's been a really long day. So if you have to get up and stretch, please do take the opportunity to do so. All right. So a little bit of an outline of what's going to be discussed today. I'll start off with the background and rationale for the renewal, go into the proposed scope and objectives, end with the mechanism and budget, and then turn it over for an open council discussion and vote. Just going a little bit into the background. So IGVF is considered a large and complex program. It actually just flat out is a large and complex program. Um, and because of that, a pre-council review is required. So earlier this summer, we had a meeting with uh, some council members and discussants to provide some early feedback on the draft of the concept. And this is sort of at the level of what we would hear during the open session of council. So the next slide describes some of the feedback that we received during this discussion. So this meeting took place at the end of July and included Julie, uh, excuse me, Kelly Frazier, Judy Cho, and Brent Gravely, where we presented a draft version of the concept. All discussions were supportive and provided the following recommendations. This included clarifying the difference between components one and two of the renewed program. And what we're calling uh, our components one and two are individual variant characterization centers and our variant interaction centers. Provide a bit more distinction of what we mean about each of these components and what they do. They also asked for an increased focus on education outreach through early engagement with the broader community and by the development of educational resources. There's also a call for more centralized database of variants that not only had data from IGVF, but from other data sources, and for us to aim for a better and earlier data sharing. And then last, but very importantly, for us to consider addressing diversity in the study of variants and in the experimental design, as well as how we can have more diversity within our research program teams. So we attempted to address all of this and the revision of the concept that you see and what we're going to talk about today in today's presentation. So just a little bit more background. The idea for IGVF actually started in 2017, and as I started thinking about it at that time, and really thinking about this program as a way to address the challenges of understanding genomic variation. So characterizing functional consequences of variation still continues to lag behind variant discovery and association. It remains a barrier to progress in genomics and our understanding of how genomic variation functions and how it impacts function. It's still not feasible to experimentally probe all variants in all contexts. So these were both points raised during a strategic planning process and heard in our 2019 Genome to Phenotype Workshop that's pictured here on the screen. And this is also something that was called out in our NHGRI strategic vision for 2020. 
And we also had a call for more systematic approaches, including new tactics that connect high throughput molecular readouts of functional genomic assays to phenotypes, and this being required for establishing the phenotypic consequences of all genomic variants. And you can see that in our vision today. And so all of this led to the development and launch of IGVF. The program launched in September 2021 to address this challenge. And we really focused and honed in on using a coordinated team science approach. We brought together over 100 groups through 26 research projects and centers across five different components. It's pictured here on the right, where all of the consortium members are coming together to leverage different emerging experimental and computational methods. They've been testing and comparing different approaches and working towards developing a framework to map, perturb, and predict variant impact on function. And as we think about the outcomes, it's important to lay out the timeline for the program. So I just mentioned that it was launched in September 2021. It actually is going to run through the beginning of the summer of 2026. It's a five-year program. We're just at the start of the fourth year. So here we are now. We actually started off with a planning year. So that first year of the program, all consortium members came together to talk about how to design experiments and thinking about analyses. And then that second year started our production phase. So we've actually just completed two years of production and we're starting the third year. And in that time, all members have been coming together. They've been working together on collaborative projects, exploring non-coding and coding variants individually and in a context of networks and exemplar diseases across different biological systems. They've been generating data sets, models, data processing pipelines and standards. And we've also had the development and launch of the IGBF data portal, and some data has been released. And we have the first iteration of our catalog. And so this is supposed to be a searchable catalog of measured and predicted variant impacts, as well as impacts of different genes and genomic regions. And then the underlying knowledge graph for that catalog is under development as well. We've also, during this time, been partnering with different consortia and programs. Uh, an attempt to exchange data and resources and communicate with one another. We've been partnering with the AVE Alliance or the Atlas of Various Effects, ClinGen, Gregor, and the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium. And we actually had a cross consortium meeting last year. Within IGVF, graduate students and postdocs have been participating as leads of focus groups and participating in collaborative projects. So a lot of this, if you wanted to hear more details, was presented just this past May at Council by consortium members Karen Mulkey and Jesse Ingritz. I'll also point out that we just had the marker paper for IGVF published just last week on September 4th in Nature. So if you haven't already, please check it out. And then I'd like to um, give a shout out to our Office of Communications. They put together a feature story and published on the same day as the marker paper, and you can see that on genome.gov. So as you can see, we had a lot going on in the past few years. So in thinking about the renewal of the program, we wanted to hear from the community. So we actually had a series of community listening sessions, and not just about the program, but where this field is going and where it should be going, where we wanted to seek out information and input on the future directions for understanding the effects of variance on function. And this took place this past spring, spring 2024. And we heard a series of both short-term and long-term suggestions for directions. What you're seeing here are some high-level recommendations that are most relevant to IGVF. And I'll just go through them. This includes the continued testing and identifying function of individual variants at scale, increased variant testing in biologically and disease-relevant contexts with an emphasis on cellular, environmental, and dynamic contexts, an increased priority in the diversity in terms of diversity in genetic ancestries when choosing systems and variants, and improved synergy between modelers and data generators, and doing so through iterative data collection, AI, ML, machine learning-based modeling, and targeted testing. And then also having an increase and in continued development of standards for assays, protocols, metadata, analyses, and predictions. So when we go into thinking about the scope and objectives for this new phase of the program, we really want to be able to build on the foundation laid by the first phase of IGVF. <clears throat> and so this includes a couple of things. What we really want to be able to do is continue the development of a user-focused resource for the community. That consists of the data portal and the catalog. 
We have initial versions of each. The goal is to make these a vital resource for the community. We also want to have greater coordination across projects. And this is going from data generation to analyses through resource building. This type of integration is what we want to see throughout the next phase of IGVF with more focused collaboration and coordination leading to better integration across the spectrum. We also want to see an increase in the collaboration between data generation and modeling. We've seen that in the first phase of the program through subsets of groups, but we really want to be able to increase this and have more of an impact in this area. And this includes having increased role for modeling groups in experimental design, as well as an integrative analysis. And then also we'd like to see a continued development of data processing pipelines and standards, where this is going to be useful for the community, where we can share tools and develop best practices. So for this next phase, we're keeping in mind what we've been able to accomplish during phase one, as well as what we heard from the community listening sessions, as we think about where we need to go next for phase two. We have two overarching goals. This includes enhancing the development and application of the IGVF framework, for understanding the effects of genomic variation on genome function. And the second goal is to create an expanded user-friendly community resource to support future studies. And we're going to work towards these through the following four objectives. These include testing the impact of individual genomic variants on function, studying their effects of interactions on genomic variant function, modeling and predicting impacts, and, and establishing a resource to enable future studies. So in this next phase, we're proposing four components with each reflecting the four objectives. I also would point out here, and you see the four components, that we're moving from the five components that you see in the first phase to four components here. We've actually phased out our mapping centers. We're keeping in mind that some of this work can be done in other programs. We're also thinking about what you can't see here is the, the size of the program and number of awards, where we want to reduce that number to really focus on the program and enhance collaborations. So for the next few slides, I'm going to go through each of the components and their objectives and the activities we expect of them. So first up, our individual variant characterization centers, where they'll be tasked with testing the impact of individual genomic variation on function. And they will be doing so by applying existing high throat perturbation methods and doing so systematically to assay individual variant impacts on molecular, cellular, or organismal phenotypes. They'll be testing variants in DNA, RNA, and protein coding elements and cell types and states of high value to the research community. And they'll be doing so in consideration of previous variants and cell types studied by the IGBF consortium. We also expect them to develop or bring in robust, reproducible, and portable data processing pipelines. This is critical for our actually handling the data and standardizing them. And we're hoping that the results from these centers will be used by the community and also will power variant impact predictors. Our second component, these are our variant interaction centers where they'll be studying interactions and the effects of these on genomic variant function. So we're asking these centers to come in and propose and apply a framework to study the frequency and the magnitude of interactions beyond additive. This is really a research-focused component of the program. We're asking centers to come in and tell us what type of variants should be studied, the contacts, and providing a strong rationale. They'll be developing new approaches and applying this framework to study interactions, and they'll be contributing the results of the tested combinations and models to the IGVF catalog. So some examples of systems for studying the interaction include genetic interactions, such as looking at combination of variants, combinations of variant types, and also looking at this in a range of genetic backgrounds. We're also proposing environmental interactions, such as different models of inflammation, stress, or ultimate metabolism as examples. So when you think about components one and two, they actually are distinct from one another. When we talk about this particular comment, component, it really is research focus. This is about developing new approaches, developing a framework of how to test variant interactions. While component one is using already established methods and approaches, 
and really trying to maximize the number of variants that can be tested. So thinking about this in terms of a crank, really turning a crate on data generation and getting that data out to the community. But both components will be contributing to our IGBF catalog. Okay. So our next component, the modeling and analysis centers, they'll be modeling and predicting variant impacts. We're asking them to develop, apply, and test predictive models. They'll be aiding in IGBF experimental design. We're asking them to perform integrative analysis of IGBF data across the consortium and providing analytical expertise that will be able to support the consortium-wide efforts of the program. They'll be working with other consortium and international groups on joint analyses and also on facilitating data integration. We're asking them to create tools to enable inferences about variant impact and genome function. So we're hoping they'll come in and develop or refine computational approaches in such a way that they can just demonstrate flexibility in accommodating different types of data and new types of data. And last, but definitely not least, we also have our data and coordinating center where they'll be building our community resource. They'll be building on existing IGBF efforts to develop a catalog and knowledge graph on function and variant effects, effects that'll enable searches and making data fair, so that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and ready for machine learning. They'll be seeking and incorporating using the user community feedback and development of the catalog. They'll, providing, they'll be providing the community access to data, hardened pipelines, software, and standards while also asking the center to organize different working groups for the consortium and facilitating different consortium activities as well as our annual meeting and outreach activities and developing educational materials. They'll also be expected to work with other consortia and international groups to facilitate data sharing and data interoperability. So in summary, these are components, these are their missions. We expect to have a lot of crosstalk between the different components for all of them to work with each other as well as with the data and coordinating center. And when we think about implementation of this program, we really are thinking about this as being a cross-cutting approach. So at the heart of the program, our main deliverable is the community resource. We're expecting all consortium members to organize results from assays and predictions such that they can be shared early and enable a variety of uses by the broader scientific community. So this includes our catalog and our data portal. We're going to continue using a coordinated collaborative research approach, a team science approach. All centers are expected to coordinate assays, variants, cell types, and to develop shared analysis strategies to meet our goals. And for this phase, as we have with the previous phase, we're again asking for a consideration of diversity as well as context for these studies. Importantly, we want to further emphasize and foster the importance of diverse teams within the program. I'll end here with the mechanism and budget. So NHGRI intends to commit $36 million in total cost per year for five years for this renewed program and that would be starting in FY 2026. Breaking it down by component, we expect the first three to be UN1, so these are complex research project, projects, while our data and coordinating center would be a resource-related project, or U24. Looking at them individually, our individual characterization centers, we expect to fund up to five awards, and so that would be 50 million in total cost per year. Our variant interaction centers, Again, funding up to five awards for 10 million per year. Modeling and analysis centers funding up to four, five million per year. And our data and coordinating center funding one to two for a total cost of six million per year. And that totals out to 36 million. So that's what we're proposing for this renewed version of the program. It's now time for open discussion, and I want to be able to start with our discussants, starting with Judy, followed by Brent, then Kelly, and then we can have an open discussion and vote. So I'll turn it over to Judy. Thanks, Stephanie. So um, I'm very supportive of this proposal to renew uh, the IGVF. Uh, it is an important and ambitious effort. 
Um, as Stephanie said twice, and I will say for the third time, uh, it is a large and complex uh, endeavor, but it is absolutely essential for the field to fully follow up logically uh, on GWAS studies and understanding kind of the non-coding dark area that is poorly understood at present. For disclosure, I'm a member of the EAB, um, and so currently, as Stephanie alluded to, um, IGVF is completing year two of the production phase. It's large and hairy. Uh, there's analysis of greater than two million variants with hundreds and hundreds of assays and readouts. Um, my role whenever I go to the meeting is to emphasize the importance of diversity at every step of the study design. Um, and to remind folks, currently what I've seen so far is kind of selection, of, of, is leveraging diversity uh, for selection of variants to assay. Uh, but again, it needs to be included at all steps of the analysis. Um, in addition, um, I wish, I, as an EAB member, I was encouraged to attend the monthly steering committee call. I did this, la uh, this month. Uh, we have strong leadership of strong steering committee chairs. There are a number of active focus groups involved in coding, non-coding MRPAs that ha appear to have substantial impact. And I think this is an outstanding substrate for education and outreach. Um, traditionally, we always worry in these large consortia that it's not necessarily a good training vehicle. I, I think it's not, that's clearly not the case in IGVF. I think there's enormous space uh, for trainees to learn um, in a variety of different areas. Um, thus far, the data, the, the data management, they're in the heart of production. Um, some sharing has occurred, not as much as will be needed. Um, the catalog front end has been piloted successfully. Um, it really does need to scale, and to the extent to what it can finish the scaling for this period of funding is not clear. Um, in addition, the group has made efforts to not only share data, but protocols to improve rigor and reproducibility. They've been productive, greater than 250 publications. Um, areas that they can improve is greater coordination, especially between the data producers and the modelers. Um, how, to uh, how to incentivize that is a major effort. And as written, um, the concept sheet logically uh, proposes to build on phase one and really to fully flower kind of community user focus uh, in a potential renewal period. So I'm highly supportive. Thank you, Judy. Brent? Um, sure. So I'm, I'm uh, like Judy, I'm very uh, supportive of this uh, renewal of this uh, concept. Um, I was very supportive of it the first time around. Um, I think the, the project overall is great. I think it's not, uh, um, since there's been a small amount of data that's been released, I don't think the public has yet to realize the impact that this consortium will have. And so I think getting this renewed for another round, I think is important. And I think as time goes on, people will realize that. Um, I think the, uh, the um, I think it's a really good idea to streamline the overall project um, in the second round compared to the, the first round, because it is it's a large complex uh, project. Um, I think one of the complicating issues this time around is gonna be Sort of setting a boundary on these variant interaction centers because I think the the pairwise combinations of everything is uh, essentially infinite. So I think it'll be um, difficult for both the the applicants and for um, uh, NHGRI to sort of put bounds on that. But I think uh, people should be up for the task. Um, I think it'd be great to have some opportunities for technology development within some of these projects because even though. There's a lot of great technologies out there for testing variants that exist today. I think a lot of room for improvement could be made and um, we shouldn't just let that sit to the outside uh, community for people that are not involved in these projects. Um, so I think having some opportunities for some of the applicants to propose some of that in their applications would be great as well. But overall, I'm very supportive. I think it's a, a really great project and I look forward to seeing uh, how things go moving forward. Thank you, Brent. And Kelly. Hi. I'm also very supportive of this project. Um, I just, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm also very supportive of the uh, project and its renewal. I think that there has been a lot of effort over decades of people trying to understand individual variants. And I think there's a lot of knowledge out there, and there's no way to really capture it. And what I'm really hoping is that the um, IG, 
VF can actually, the, the data coordinators and the modeling, the computational modeling, can help figure out moving forward, how can not only the, the variants that are studied in this project, but the variants that are studied by the community at large, how can we keep track of this data and, and make it readily accessible to people that, um, you know, they find a variant that's associated with some disease. Is, is there a database that they can go look that variant up? And I think that that will be an exciting um, outcome of this project if it can be achieved. Thank you. Happy to turn it to her, open it up. Yeah, so um, the variant interaction part of this is really interesting. Is that a new part or was there always a variant interaction component to the project? That is a new part. We actually had network projects before and um, but the variant interaction centers has really come about through the community listening sessions. We heard a lot about um, questions of whether or not there's anything going on beyond additive effects of individual variants when you look at them in combination. Is that true? Is it not? How can we study it? And a lot of suggestions on how to do that. So it seemed reasonable to think about trying oh, to incorporate okay. that into the program and really research into that. Yeah, and I, so I, it, it is a, Interaction is so ubiquitous in the model systems, but, but in some sense, that's a part of the construction of model systems. And so understanding whether interaction is really a major component of human genetics, I think, you know, is, is, is gonna be really critical. So I'm, but I, I wanna come back to something Brent said, which is, that is, is, this is a really hard space because you can't really do everything yeah. by everything. And what you do and don't do um, will, ha it will have to be prescribed in a careful way because there's some subset where you really should do everything by everything. Some, some piece of this should be some part of everything by everything. And then some of it should be in part driven by the modelers on what's the most likely ways yes. that we end up in interaction spaces. So I, I think this will be a really interesting challenge for the groups, um, but essential. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. <laughs> so, you know, we all have to think carefully about writing the NOFO and realizing this is not going to be a comprehensive look at all interactions, but really how do we do it? What are the most important combinations to think about testing and how to do it? So we hope to, we hope to learn a lot. Yes. A couple of comments. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is there a way, because this consortium could potentially have interaction with so many other NHGRI consortia, uh, Morphic or yes. Clingen, um, Mave, Abe. Um, is there a way to formalize that? Um, you know, say like a yearly meeting of the consortium with these other consortia. So we uh, internally within program, we talk with each other. We have our own working groups, and um, we actually are thinking about another meeting. So last year there was a cross consortium meeting of the programs that you saw listed on that screen. And so we'll be thinking about having another one like that. And even if we don't have a formal meeting like that, we have a lot of opportunities to have cross-talk internally and also participate in, participation in each other's working group meetings. So we have a lot going on in that way too. And following up along those lines in um, uh, interactions with not those consortia, but other investigators, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is there a mechanism for affiliate? Would you consider an affiliate? We currently have an affiliate <coughs> membership program and, then, and we'll continue with that. And secondly, can people nominate variants uh, for study? Because you know, if you have four investigators, unless they're doing it genome-wide, uh, is there a way to prioritize certain you know, variants, for certain GWAS variants, for example, that should be considered for scrutiny or prioritized? So we don't have a mechanism for the broader community to nominate variants at this time. 
But I think we'd be interested in hearing what people are interested in studying, especially when they start to see the data being released from the portal and the first iteration of the catalog and what else we need to be thinking about. And we also are asking our investigators to think about what should be studied, who you should be talking to, other programs, other investigators as well. Because yeah. I think at the last presentation, there was <clears throat> discussion of coronary artery disease, for example, that there was a very in-depth study of coronary artery disease. Uh, but maybe there are investigators uh, that would champion other diseases and may nominate certain variants that have been uh, so far opaque to investigation. We haven't been able to figure out what the, um, how the variant affects the phenotype. So that could be considered as a way, if there was a portal that you could submit uh, variants that the steering committee could look at and yeah. potentially prioritize. That's a helpful suggestion. Thank you. Go ahead, Tim. Um, so thank you for presenting this. I'm, I'm a PI on one of the IGPF grants currently for disclosure. Um, so I think this is, I like, the, I'm super supportive of the program. I think the ideas of streamlining it are great. I'd love to hear that you're thinking about how to improve interaction between some of the predictive modeling centers, some of the characterization centers, et cetera. Um, one, maybe a couple, I don't want to be too operational, but there's no longer a planning year. Um, mm -hmm. How is, was that a response to the planning year? Do you feel like the planning year wasn't super effective, that on a renewal, or was that discussed? Tim, you were there. <laughs> so. Well, right, so now I'm asking from no, your perspective. So I'm, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm being silly. <laughs> um, as, as you know, the planning year was to take into consideration that we're bringing all these different groups together. Everyone came in with different ideas, and it's an opportunity to see what each project and award was proposing and talk about it. Um, and it was really an, an interesting process to go through, but something to be aware of, it, it takes time to have a consortium gel. I'd say part of that was our gelling period. I think probably most of us would say that. <laughs> and a lot of social engineering comes into it. Um, I would also keep in mind that this is the first time we did IGVF, so there's real value to having a planning year for the first start of a new program. And so we're trying to take advantage of the fact that we've had a number of years of the program, and we're developing this framework that we can apply when we go into the renewal. So of course, it's going to be ramp up time expected, but we won't have that dedicated planning year. So then part of the reason I'm asking is I'm wondering how does the, how do the incoming, um, I forgot the name of it, but the sort of the production centers, um, how do, how do is there going to be, how are you going to make sure that they're not just treading the same ground? In other words, you know, as they're putting in proposals now, the variant catalog isn't going to be available, um, you know, how do we make sure that they're not just assaying the same variants again? And how, how are you thinking about creating well, a phase two that builds in that way? Yes. So it won't be right now. So we, we do want you to get as much out as possible through the data portal. We'd love to get that first iteration of the catalog out because it'd be great to refer to that in any sort of notebooks put together. But I think we're going to be asking for a strong justifications of why you're proposing the variants you're studying. Have you taken into consideration what's already out there? What are you considering? Have you looked at what we have in the portal so far? And obviously, it won't be everything that IGVF phase one um, has been producing won't all be available, but we'll be mindful of that and try to keep that in mind. Yeah, it might be worth encouraging study designs that are flexible so that way when mm -hmm. they start, you can take into, event, take into account all that's happened in the grant review writing period. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thanks. Any last comments? All right. Can I get a motion to approve? And then a second. All right, all in favor, and please keep your hands up while I count. <laughs> all right, uh, so no opposed, no abstaining. I think we're good. All right, thank you, everyone.